All right, it is 10 a.m., so we'll go ahead and get started with Sunday School this morning. So good to see each and every one of you here this morning in the Lord's house, and uh, looking forward to a great week. Palm Sunday today, and then of course next week is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and I'm so thankful that every Sunday can be Resurrection Sunday, and uh, so thankful that our God is not dead, He's on the throne, and He's living, and uh, He cares, He sees the sparrow that falls, and He's watching over you, and He's watching over me, and so uh, we're looking forward to that. Hope you're uh, ready for uh, having a mind to work, and uh, we'll just uh, remember the Lord's, uh, you know, um, resurrection, but also we'll have a sunrise service over um, at the ocean. Um, there's a post on Facebook. If you need directions, we'll talk about that more in the service to come and where we'll meet and transportation and shuttling and all that. And so I hope you'll be there. I hope you'll invite someone uh, to be a part of that. And so let's go ahead and get started this morning with some prayer requests. Um, let's, I got a new prayer list today, and so um, if I didn't mention anything, uh, just please remind me um, or just update us. Uh, be in prayer for Miss Barbara and Brother Gary. Um, hospice has been uh, called in, and they've been with him about 24 uh, hours a day, 24-7 uh, with him. And uh, he's to the last leg of his earthly journey, and uh, it will be uh, probably... Uh, um, seeing what happens in the near future, you know, with him, but please be in prayer for uh, Miss Barbara um, in this time, and uh, just looking forward to what the Lord's going to do there, and then pray for Brother Zane, and uh, you know that he broke his hip, has been uh, recovering and in rehab, and so he's doing uh, better, doing well, doing his physical therapy, and so he's itching to get out of the <laughs> hospital, and so yes, sir. I, he I, he is still I believe still in the hospital. Um, I believe it's the one in Ormond, um, I, but I don't know the the room or or that. Um, but we'll try to get that information, you know, for you. Um, but yes, yeah, as, as far as I know, he's still in the hospital, uh, just doing like some in house, uh, not in home, but the the therapy that the hospital provides. And so I, I believe they did do a partial hip replacement, um, put some bolts and some nuts in in that uh, in the pelvic area. Uh, but he's re doing quite well, and uh, he said he'll be watching this morning, and so we're praying for you, Brother Zane, and um, looking forward to having you here in the Lord's house shortly. Um, pray for our missionaries, um, Robinson, Grusau, and Haiti. Um, there's a lot of civil unrest uh, over there, and a lot of the gangs are have taken over, like, the airport and several government buildings, and it's uh, pretty bad down there. And So just pray for God's protection and safety for our missionaries down there. Uh, especially Robinson Grusel. Is there anyone else has a prayer request or a praise or something, Brother Wes? Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Robert Morgan, lost his mother in the Holocaust. And uh, he was actually shot in the back. Okay. Brother Wes is asking prayers for a friend of his, Robert Morgan. Um, his mother just passed away, and so uh, just be in prayer for that family. Rob Porter, okay. Uh, Robert Porter um, lost his mother, and so uh, just be in prayer for this family um, as they're dealing with the loss of, um, of their mother at this time. And um, is, are they local, do you know? Okay. Okay. Well, if there's anything that we can do, um, just let us know. Um, anyone else have a prayer request or praise, Miss Sue? Yes. Continue to pray for Miss Sue, her arthritis in her neck and her back, and also her sister Sharon, as she uh, is in search for um, a room and care. And so we'll certainly be continuing to pray for you. Um, I don't see the Shamblins here this morning. Um, I know he had an unspoken prayer request, just trying to recall. Um, and so pray for Brother Shamblin, and then I know he's um, he had this port put in, or not port, but um, uh, re battery replacement. I know that incision is still kind of sore. It's been kind of sore. And so just be in prayer for him um, and, and that. Um, I know he'd appreciate that. Anyone else have a prayer request or a praise or anything like that before we go to the Lord in prayer? Yes, sir, Brother Everett.
Okay. Brother Everett is, um, had, uh, he had a bone scan this past week, and um, they, it's still showing cancer, but it's not spreading, it's not growing, it's just um, staying in place. And so we'll continue to pray for Brother Everett, um, but we're praising the Lord that the cancer hasn't grown at all, and so we're praising the Lord for that. Yes, ma'am. And how about that kid? How did he get to see you? Oh. Always pray for me, please, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I appreciate it. Um, the procedure went well, as well as it could go, and uh, they didn't see anything. In fact, um, the, this procedure was better than the last one I had, and so there was improvement. So we praise the Lord for that. They did do a biopsy, um, but I don't think that it's going to be anything of concern. Um, and so I'm just going to trust the Lord for it. Nothing to worry about. And so uh, overall, it's a praise. So we thank the Lord for that. And so um, thank you for all your prayers for sure. Uh, anyone else have a prayer request or a praise before we get to the Lord in prayer? All right. Well, let's go ahead and do that. And you pray right there in your seat, and then we'll dive into our Sunday school lesson this morning. And let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for, Lord, just the opportunity, Lord, that we can come before your holy throne, Lord, and bow in prayer. And Lord, just bring our uh, petitions before you, Father, and Lord, that you will hear us, Lord. And uh, Lord, we're so thankful for the many blessings and, and your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord, that you give us each and every day. And Lord, uh, your mercies are new every morning. And Lord, we cannot be thankful enough for all that you do for us. Lord, we're praying for this church. We're praying for our pastor, Lord, and Lord, for his leadership, Lord, and as he guides this church, Lord, in the way that you would have him go. And Lord, I pray that he would be drawing closer to you each and every day. Lord, be with his message this morning, Lord, that you'll just fill him, Lord, with the Holy Spirit and power of God. Lord, as people come, Lord, as people are making their way, Lord, that you would give them safety on the roads, Lord, that they would come here safely, Lord, and have open ears, ears, Father, but more importantly, open hearts, Lord, to what you would have for us. Lord, speak to us, Lord, and, and uh, bring to our mind, Lord, and our attention, Lord, the things that may be in between us and you, Lord, that we may uh, for, uh, ask for forgiveness, Father, uh, for these things. Lord, I pray that you'll be with each Sunday school teacher, each worker, Lord, each person, Lord, that you'll just bless them, Father, help them. Lord, help us to draw closer to you as a church each and every day. Lord, I pray for our building, Lord, that you'll just lead and guide us, Lord, in the place and the location where you would have us, Lord. And if it's here, Lord, may we just continue to be at it, Lord, to serve you. And Lord, if there's a, a place, a piece of property, Lord, may you bring that to our attention, Lord, at the right time, if it be thy will. Lord, we're praying for Brother Gary and Miss Barbara this morning, that you'll just be with her, comfort her, Father, help her, Lord, in this time. Lord, I pray for Brother Zane, Lord, that you'll continue to give him good health and recovery, Lord, so that he could be home. And Lord, I know he wants to be in your house. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to be with him. Lord, I think of Robertson Grusau, Lord, in Haiti and other missionaries, Lord, that are down there, Lord, that are serving you. And Lord, I can't imagine the, the times that they're living and how, how dangerous it must be. Lord, I just pray that you'll just uh, provide for them in each and every day. Lord, have your hand over them, Father, in such a way, Lord, may you protect them, Father. And Lord, I pray for Brother Wes's friend, uh, Robert Porter, Lord, who lost his mother, Lord, and, and Lord, it's such a difficult time for him, Lord, and his family, and I pray, Lord, that you'll just wrap your arms around him, Father, and comfort him, Father, and his, uh, his family, and uh, Lord, in this time, and may we as a church, Lord, be a blessing to them. Lord, we're praying for Miss Sue and her sister Sharon as she, as she is still in search for a room, Lord, that you'll just uh, provide that need, um, Lord, and, and we're going to thank you now for it. We're also praying for Miss Sue's arthritis, Lord, that you'll just be with any pain and discomfort that she deals with, Lord, on a daily basis. Father, that you'll just help her, Father. And uh, Lord, may you even ease that or take that from her. Lord, we're praying for Brother Shamblin's unspoken prayer request. Lord, you know the need that he has. And Lord, I pray that you'll just meet that need according to thy will. For Brother Everett, Lord, we're praising you, Lord, for the great report that the cancer hasn't spread, Lord. But Lord, I, I, I know that he's still dealing with it. Lord, and I pray that you'll just uh, touch his body, Lord, and give him strength and wisdom each and every day in his life. Lord, thank, we're, thank you, Lord, for the great report that I had this past week, Lord, and that there was no issues, Lord, nothing to be concerned about. And Lord, we're just giving you all the praise and the glory for it. Lord, again, be with us this morning, Lord, as we uh, dive into your word, Lord, that we may learn something from you and apply it to our lives. Lord, be with this church again. We love and thank you in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn to 2 Kings chapter 1, 2 Kings chapter 1. And for the past three weeks, 
uh, we've been talking about one specific Bible character, and, uh, and what a man of God he was. And uh, if you recall, the man was Elijah, and uh, what a man of God. And before that, we talked about a wicked man, uh, Jeroboam, a wicked king, and making bad decisions. And before that, uh, we talked about Solomon, one of the wisest men, aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, who has ever walked the face of this earth. Uh, but as we dive into this study and as we continue to look at the life of Elijah, again, you know, we talk about different seasons of life, and we all have different seasons that we go through. And, uh, and each uh, time that we go through these those seasons of life, uh, there are things and applications and trials and testings and things that you go through and things that I will go through uh, that would hopefully draw us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we continue to look at this uh, man's life of Elijah, we see that how much he loved God and how much he wanted to serve God and, and to be a man of God. And by the way, it's not organic. It's, it's something that just doesn't happen uh, where God is just going to fill your life uh, with his power. Uh, you're going to have to take steps. There are things that you're going to have to do uh, to, to have a desire to draw closer to God, to have a desire to serve God. And uh, of course, uh, you know, you're saved, but you still battle that flesh. You still battle the things that you want to do, the decisions that you want to make. Uh, you know, as a young person, uh, as you become an adult and say, you know, am I going to go to church? Am I going to marry the right person? Am I going to uh, take that leadership role and set that spiritual temperature in my life uh, to be dedicated to serve God, to go to church, you know, every time the doors are open, and not just go to church, but go to the right church. Uh, you know, there's a lot of places that call themselves churches, uh, but they're not necessarily a New Testament church. They're not necessarily a church that certainly God recognizes as a New Testament church. And so there's a lot of decisions that we have to make, and Elijah made a lot of good decisions. Now, he wasn't without sin, and we talked about that. Every character that we look and read about certainly had their faults, certainly had their shortcomings, and if you look at my life, I have shortcomings. And if you look at the mirror in your own life, you say, you know what, I too had shortcomings. We all have shortcomings, but what a beautiful thing it is to serve a God of second chances, to serve a God that says, you know, I will help you even when you don't think you can do it. And so as we dive into this third part of our series of the life of, the life of Elijah, we'll see here, and let's read in verse number 9, 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And the Bible says this, then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat up on the top of a hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him in his fifty. We see here in the studying the life of Elijah that this is often misunderstood by some people in a church, but there has always been an instance upon God's people having a respect for the man of God. You know, as we have our pastors, we have a leadership, we ought to respect the office, but have a respect for the pastor, have a respect for the man of God. You think about the life and, and the the. The, the, the journey that Moses had through the wilderness. And oftentimes you would see in studying the years that the children of Israel spent in the wilderness, what did they often do? Did they often rejoice? Uh, did they often praise the Lord? Did they oftentimes give thanks and, 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 and holiness and admiration to God? No. What did they oftentimes do as you read the, uh, the story of the children of Israel? What did they do? They complained. And they complained not just against God, but they complained against the man of God, the man that God had given, given uh, the children of Israel to lead them. And they complained oftentimes about Moses. I think of Numbers 27. And the Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man of whom is in spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. And he sent him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight, that they may put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. You know, gifts are wonderful. I love getting gifts, and I'm sure you love getting gifts too. 
And our pastor that we have, and any pastor, a good pastor that's worth his salt, is a gift from God. And we ought to thank God for the gifts he's given us and thank God for the man of God that he's given us. You can search to and fro. You can go up north. You can go to the east or to the west. You'll end up in the ocean. And you can go to all these places, and you'll be hard-pressed to find a church like this church. Now, I'm not saying this church is for everyone, though I think everyone should come here. Uh, Not everyone can drive two hours to come here. And so we have local churches. But you'll be hard-pressed in this day and age to find a good church that preaches, thus saith the Lord, that preaches the Word of God from the King James Bible, that doesn't omit or take away or add anything, uh, and they preach the whole counsel of the Bible, you can look and you'll be hard-pressed. You can go to people in this church. I'm not going to call anyone out, but there are people who drive 45 minutes to an hour to come here, not because there's anything great and special about this church. And I say, I know the church is you, but about the building, uh, but it's because of the Holy Spirit of God resides here. And uh, I don't know about you, but I want to be under the spout where the glory of God is coming out, but have respect for the man of God. It's very easy for us when we fall and backslide into our own temptations, into our own sin, or when the pastor preaches a message, maybe upon a particular sin that you may be involved in. It might be an open sin. It might be a hidden sin or a secret sin. And you think, man, this preacher is reading my mail. Uh, He's talking to me, and man, I talked to someone else about this, and I bet they went to the preacher, and they told him all the things that I'm doing Could it be possible, though, that our pastor just walks with God and he is just preaching what God laid upon his heart, and it is the Holy Spirit of God working on your heart, stepping on your toes, saying you need to get right. And by the way, what a life to be lived for God when you don't have anything on your shoulders and you just say, Lord, I'm giving this to you. Forgive me, Father, and help me, and I promise you God will, and he's able to help you. When Jesus Christ died on the cross... He already forgiven you of your sin, but it is oftentimes us that hold and harbor our sin and think we can't overcome it. And by you and yourself and your own ways and your own strength and your own might, you're right. You might not be able to overcome a particular sin, but with the Lord's help, I'm so thankful that he will uphold you with his hand. Don't complain about the man of God. Don't go home and and have preacher for lunch or for breakfast or for dinner or for dessert. Uh, Just pray for him. Pray for your pastor. Pray that he walks with God. He has to make decisions every day, and decisions oftentimes aren't easy. And uh, don't complain and don't uh, uh, talk negatively about your preacher. By the way, don't let anyone else talk negative about your preacher. Defend your man of God and say, hey, that's my man of God. Don't talk about him. There's a fine line, may I say, though, of man worship. There's uh, oftentimes it can be crossed in a line where Uh, the congregation or the people almost worship their pastor and they bow before them and they kiss his feet and kiss his ring. And I say, that ought not be. Uh, Our pastor, he he will tell you, he'll be the first one to tell you, he's not the savior. He's not perfect. He puts on his pants just like you do. He puts on a shirt just like you do. He is not any more special, but God has called him to do a special work and to a work that not everyone's called to do. And so don't let people talk about him, but it's not, let's not cross the line and say, you know what, I'm going to worship my pastor. I'm going to reverence him and call him Almighty King and kiss his ring. Uh, he would probably love that. I'm just kidding. You awake? Uh, we, let's not do that. Let's not worship the man of God, but let's respect the man of God. There's a fine line between that. Elijah demanded that these soldiers uh, treat him with respect that was due for his office. Elisha, we remember we talked about him, was responsible for a number of children being torn to shreds by two bears because they refused to show respect to the man of God. You can read that in 2 Kings chapter 2, 23 and 24. And uh, these children, you say, man, that's horrible. Uh, but God takes very seriously the office of the pastor, the office of a man of God. And by the way, it's not just your pastor, it's other pastors. Sometimes you can have a bad experience or maybe, because like I said, pastors are sinners. (laughs) They're not perfect. They ought to walk with God. They ought to strive uh, to do that. But maybe you had experience. And how many times have you run into people or know someone in your family or know a friend or a relative or a neighbor? You're out door to door. And they say, oh, I have nothing to do with church anymore because this pastor 
They, they hurt me. And they, can I tell you, man will fail you. Man will hurt you. And shame on those who are involved in sin and honestly shouldn't be pastors. But don't harbor the bitterness. Don't harbor the things that they did uh, for their sin. If that begins to root itself in your life, it becomes not just anger, but bitterness. And now you're not right with God. It is so important for our relationship with, our, with God to be right. Because if your relationship this way is good, then your relationships that way will be good. Sometimes we think, well, I got to take control and I got to fix it. Say, no, the Lord says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Pray for those. But can I tell you, pastors have fallen. Many pastors have fallen. Many pastors have gotten into wicked, wicked sin. But it's not your job to criticize them, to call them names. Uh, to, uh, that's God will take care of them. And by the way, we'll all stand before God and each pastor will have a, an account, not just for their family, not just for themselves, but they will give an account for the churches uh, that they led. Be very careful to criti- not to criticize people, uh, but call sin by its name. If pastor, not our pastor, but if there's a pastor that's involved in sin, I guess I would not probably involve myself or put my influence in that church. Uh, I would not want to be a part of that. Pray for your pastor. Uh, But again, uh, God didn't take too kindly about these children talking about the man of God this way, and he took care of business. Let God take care of business. He's very good at it. Uh, Sometimes we take things our way, and it doesn't go the way God wanted it or intended to. Uh, Paul uh, demanded the respect was due uh, due by him by the virtue of him being an apostle. You can read about that in Romans I don't want to take too long on this uh, point, but I think you got the point. Respect the man of God. It's it's so important to respect the pastor and the office and help and pray for him each and every day. Uh, Number two, he was willing to be led of God. He was willing to be led of God. 1 Kings 1, 13 through 15. The Bible says this, And he sent again a captain of 30 and 50, and with the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. Uh, You see, Elijah didn't want to do this. Uh, Elijah knew that this could have been a trick designed to bring him uh, arrest or even death. But yet when he was informed by this angel, the angel came to him. He was ready to present himself to the king. You know, everything that's going on here in these verses went against uh, Elijah's logic. Uh, He was like, I don't want to do this. This is against everything that I want to do. But he knew that this was a command from the Lord. And once again, it went against his feelings. It went against his previous orders from the Lord. And it went against the public opinion, for surely the sons of the prophets would have never recommended that he go down and do this. But can I tell you, anytime God gives you instruction, anytime God just says to do something, it would be wise for us to just do it. Sometimes we say, Lord, this goes against everything that I, I believe. You want me to serve in church? I'm, I'm really good at warming a pew. Uh, but God's maybe laying something upon your heart about serving in the nursery or singing in the choir or helping in the sound booth or helping in junior church or helping in some capacity, maybe in the cleaning area. There's no job too small. Uh, there's no task that doesn't go unnoticed by God. Uh, and it goes against everything you think. Like, Lord, you can't use me. I've given the illustration before. When I was a young man, teenager, I never thought God would ever call me uh, to preach the gospel, not to pastor, but to preach. I felt that it was just a a calling to serve him in some capacity of music, and I limited God's ability to use me because of what my logic was. I'm like, God, you'll use me, but only in this area. And it wasn't until I was much older that God told me, not not an audible voice, obviously, but God began to work and speak and, and really chisel at my heart. God said, I could use you more if you would just let me, if you would just uh, soften up your heart and just say, it may not make sense to you, but it's what I want you to do. It goes against our feelings. Sometimes we don't feel like serving God. We don't feel like reading our Bible. We don't feel like praying. We don't feel like doing the things that we know we ought to do. Uh, But it's not about your feelings. It's not about my feelings. 
is about what does God want, what does God expect in doing it. And I promise you, every time you read God's word, uh, read until God speaks to you. Every time you pray, pray until God just gets a hold of your heart. Every time you come to church, let your prayer be, Lord, speak to me, reveal something in me. And we don't like to feel that, uh, that uncomfortable feeling, but God will speak to you. God will show you, and God will help you. Uh, sometimes you think, well, God wants me to do this, and then you're feeling, well, now I think God wants me to do that. Lord, what is it? Just obey God. And if you're not sure, a good place to be is like, Lord, I will just wait upon you. He was willing to be led of God. How did Elijah have God's hand upon his life? What was so special? What was so great about Elijah? Uh, He was just willing to be led of God. Lord, guide my footsteps. Lord, guide my tongue. Remember that song you sang maybe in junior church or uh, when you're a little boy, a little girl in Sunday school? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you touch. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say or tongue, what you say. May all of these things be led of God uh, as he wants to lead and use your life. He was willing to be led of God. Number three, he was willing to help the next generation. We have a group of people, young people, little people, little boys and little girls who are looking up to our teenagers, who are looking up to you and who are looking up to me. Are we investing in the lives of our young people? You know, there's a lot of people who invested in my life. Preachers, youth pastor, our pastor invested um, countless hours countless days. He invested in in Marco, not to to point people out, but just for the purpose of illustration. Um, There's been men of God who invested not just their time, but their money, their influence upon my life. There are people who invested prayers. I think of my family. I think of my parents. I think of churches that I previously went to, of God only knows who prayed for me. Are we investing in young people? Are we investing in others? You see here, Elijah was willing to help the next generation, but we're oftentimes we can become very selfish in our thinking. And there's, by the way, and I say, and we used this illustration before, if you want to help someone else, you really need to help yourself. If you have problems in your life, if there is sin in your life and you know about it, just get it right with God so you can help others. Uh, but we have to be good examples. We have to show people, uh, especially the, this younger generation and teenagers and, and, and those younger than them, that God is the import, most important thing, that he may have the what preeminence of your life. It's not just God is first place, but God is number one and only number one. Uh, they say having plan B is only a distraction from plan A. And if church for you doesn't work out because you wanted life to go your way and it's not going your way, so you say, you know what, I'm just going to resort to plan B. Well, God just wasn't number one. He was just, he wasn't the preeminence in your life. God just, he can't just be number one. He has to be number one and only number one. There shouldn't be a resort of plan B if this whole church thing doesn't work out because guess what? If it goes your way, it's not going to work out. But when it goes God's way, it always works out. We have to watch, look out for those who are following us. You have kids, you don't have kids. There are children all around this campus who are looking at you. And if you heard, if you've been to this church any length of time, we've said it before and we'll say it again, what we do in moderation, our children will do in excess. Wow, why does this preacher always harp on us about coming to Sunday school? Well, you're here. Guess what? Not everyone's here. Why does the preacher, why does the Sunday school teacher harp on us about coming Sunday morning? Why do they encourage us to come Sunday night? Why do they want us to come Wednesday night? Why do they want us to come soul winning? How come they want us to come to all these special meetings? And you heard this phrase, come to church every time the doors are open. The doors are always always open here. Always open. Because we need a refuge. We need a place to go. And if we think that we can just take a step back from Christianity, that we can take a step back from serving God, that we can take a step back, well, I'm just missing a Sunday night. I get it. Times are tough. Things are hard. 
uh, there are circumstances that, that happen and, and, and you cannot come to church. But if you can come to church and you know you ought to come to church, then you ought to be in church. Not so we can just see your face because it's not about you seeing me and it's not about me seeing you. Though, by the way, it encourages me and it encourages the pastor when you're here, but it encourages others. And when you come and these little kids come, they're going to say, wow, they're always at church. You know what I hear a lot? Brother Jeremy, you're always at church. That's true. But I love church. I love coming here. I love seeing you, but I love seeing my Savior. You know, if we had a dignified representative here, I bet a lot of people would come. But more importantly than a county representative or some sort of uh, a senator or some sort of king or some sort of president or some sort of a CEO of a company, we have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we always say this, and I always say this, I don't want him just to be present. I want him to participate. I want him to work in my life, and I hope that you would want him to work in your life. Nothing should come between your soul and the Savior. And children and young people ought to know that when the doors are open, we're going to church. Go to church. The lessons that you see here these can be sermons in and of itself, as Elijah uh, was teaching and training Elijah, was every time he went to a place, there was a lesson to be learned. Uh, again, I'll reiterate, the different seasons of your life, there are different lessons to be learned as you go through these different seasons. And one of the lessons that you would learn that Elijah was showing Elisha was you need to burn your bridges. In Gilgal, which means to roll away, it portrays the fact that after 40 long years, God was willing to put away the disgrace of the wilderness uh, wanderings. Uh, you look at your past and you say, man, my past was horrible. Uh, my past wasn't uh, the way that I, I, I wish it would have been. Maybe you had issues with your parents or a church or whatever the case may be. There may have been sin in your life, and there was a span in, in your life that you were away from God. I'm not going to get into it for sake of time, but my own testimony Three years I spent wandering in my own wilderness, uh, doing my own thing, doing it my way, thinking that I can have one foot in the church while having one foot in the world. And by the way, when you realize it, both feet are in the world. It's impossible to have one foot in church and one foot in the world. You say, well, I'll just tread that line. It's impossible. You either serve God or the, you either serve mammon. You'll have a God at the end of the day. It's either the God of heaven or it's the God of this world, but you're not going to serve God and you're not going to serve mammon. You're not going to go to church on Sunday and go to live like the devil on Monday and think that it's going to work out for you. It's not going to work out, but can I just remind you to burn those bridges? If you got right with God, if you put it under the blood of Jesus Christ, if you, you, you said, you know what, I'm going to forget it, and oftentimes that's hard, do your best and say, Lord, help me to move on, but burn those bridges. Roll on. God's forgiven you. God has Place that sin and that, that circumstance under the mercy seat. Don't lift it up. Don't let the devil come to you and remind you who you used to be. Burn those bridges. Number two, learn to walk with God. He also, Elijah brought Elisha to Bethel, which means what? Does anyone know? House of God or house of bread. And it teaches Elijah that we must be willing to be sacrificed with God alone. Perhaps one of the most notable events at Bethel was when Jacob met God there face to face and eventually became a man who was broken by God. Do we ever want to say this, Lord, break my heart? Lord, break my fallow ground. You know that, that tough part in your life. You know that area in your life that God doesn't have a hold of that secret chamber in your heart that no one goes into, not even you, but you know it's there. You know it ought not be there. You'll never be able to walk with God until you have a clean heart that's removed of any type of hardness or bitterness. Walk with God. Why would we want to live a life that we carry burden and stress Anxiety and anger and bitterness and loneliness and, and on and on you can go. That's no way to live and that is no way God wants you to live. 
Learn to walk with God, and each and every day, Lord, reveal to me if there's anything between us, and God will reveal it to you. But come to church. Uh, it's when we come to church, it's when we see God face to face that we hear the, the power. And, and, and I can't tell you how many times, maybe you in your own life can say, there are times a pastor preached the message, and the title of his message or even his sermon had nothing to do with what God was speaking to me about. And God had his own message for you. God had something completely different for you. But where did you hear it at? At the house of God, in his house. I'm not saying you can't pray and, and you can't read your Bible in your own, the convenience of your own home. But nothing should ever replace, nothing should ever take the place of church. Uh, it's been four years. In fact, I was telling preacher this past week, uh, today was four years, I say exactly, not necessarily to the day, but to the Sunday, where we had uh, COVID services. You remember those days? Uh, most of you, I don't think, were here. Some of you were. And we had chairs out in the parking lot. We didn't have a tent yet, and we just sat there, and the seats were distance, and everyone was, you know, five feet this way and four feet of that way. And we had the piano and the sound system we set out there, and it was hot and it was muggy. And uh, do you remember those days? But guess what? A lot of people started watching church online. And we gave the government two weeks to slow the spread, not to stop the spread, and on and on. You remember that. This was four years ago. Uh, imagine 50 years should the Lord tarry is coming and children reading in schools. What happened between 2019 and 2024? It's just going to be a whole blur because no one <laughs> knew what was going on, what people were doing. But a lot of people got out of church. A lot of people... So, uh, uh, sacrifice church, and they just said, you know, I don't have to go to church anymore. I can watch it from home, and I'm thankful for the internet. I'm thankful for uh, the technology that we were able to get out there and, and still preach the Word of God, and people were still able to hear the Word of God, but there's nothing like coming into the house of God, being here in person. I don't know about you, but I cannot stand telehealth visits. I cannot stand calling a doctor, giving them a copay, because you still, they still have to get paid, and they say, well, we'll still take your money, but we're going to diagnose you over the phone. How are you going to look at my throat? How are you going to look in my ears? How are you going to take a stethoscope and listen to my heart or listen to my chest? How are you going to properly diagnose me from a telephone? You can't do that. But can I tell you, I'm not saying that God can't diagnose you over the internet, but can I just say that God speaks to you in such a way when you're in the house of God that you cannot replace it by just watching a service over the internet. I'll get off of that high horse. I'm off of the soapbox. Uh, learn to walk with God. Learn that the blessings uh, of instant obedience. You remember Jericho? Uh, uh, the, the story of Jericho, which means fragrant. God alludes us to the occasion when God's people were willing to, willing to help bring a miracle about by their instant obedience, by marching around a city under the leadership of Joshua. You know what delayed obedience is? Disobedience. When God just says, do something, just do it. Uh, you would save your life a lot of heartache if you just obey God. If you just say, yes, sir, Lord, I'll do it. It may not make sense. You say, he may call you to walk around the city and do it and not say a word and walk around the city another day and not say a word. Lord, that doesn't make sense. Remember, it went against their logic. It went against the, maybe their feelings like, Joshua, this doesn't make any sense. We're walking around the city. We're not supposed to say anything. And God's going to take care of this? Like, sure thing. They just obey God. Things may not make sense to you, but just obey God. Because at the end of the day, when you get to heaven... You'll look back and say, God, I knew what you're trying to do. I know what you're trying to do. What about this lesson? That the only way up is down. Jordan means descender. And in describing the Jordan River, he was pointing to the necessity of Elisha to be willing to become a nobody. Now, don't take this the wrong way. <laughs> You are special. The Bible says you are what? A peculiar people. Uh, God made each and every one of you, and you are fearfully and what? Wonderfully made. Don't think for one second that you are a nobody. But what we're talking about here is don't think that you are a somebody, that you are God's gift to this earth, 
and that you're Mr. High and Mighty and that you're looking down your nose upon other people because there go I. We can all fall into sin. Uh, we can all mess up. Uh, we can all do the wrong thing. We can all say the wrong thing. We can all go the wrong way. We can all mess up. Uh, the the, uh, the good, uh, good man, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Though he, what? Fall. Even the good man falls. We may all fall. We will all fall. We will all fall short of the glory of God, but I'm so thankful that he upholdeth me with his hand. You have to learn, you know what, to be humble, to be humble. God can use anyone. God doesn't have to use me. I'm so thankful that he, that he has, and I hope that he continue would to use me. But how can God use me if I'm saying, Lord, I'll, I got it from here. <laughs> you got me this far, thanks God, but I got it from here. I can do it on my own. There's nothing more terrifying than, than standing behind a pulpit and preaching or teaching in front of you. You say, what's so scary about me? The awesome responsibility to preach, thus saith the Lord, is something that's not taken lightly. It's a matter of life and death, and people are listening, not just to the words that I have to say. By the way, say this. Don't listen to me, but listen to the Holy Spirit of God. How is God speaking to you? How is God working in your life? I'm a nobody. Remember, it is not I, but Christ. I must be dead to self. I must wake up every day and crucify my flesh and say, Lord, today is not about me. Today is about you. God will use, and God has used anyone who's just willing to be used of him. He was willing to serve the Lord all the days of his life. 2 Kings chapter 2, 11 will be finished. And it came to pass as they went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them, uh, parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Well, it is commendable uh, that Elisha chose to stay with the man of God until he was taken up by a, a chariot of fire. It is weakly, uh, equally commendable that Elijah is found doing what God had him to do up until the time, excuse me, of his departure. Serve God. Serve God. See, I'm getting older in life. It's hard for me to do that. You can pray. We need prayer. Some of our greatest failures are prayer failures. We need men of God who will pray for this church. We need women of God who will pray for this church. I can't go soul winning. I can't walk. Pray for those who are. Pray for those doors of, whom, of which we have no idea who's going to answer behind uh, that door. The things that they might be going through. There's a lot of things that everyone can do, but don't stop serving God. Don't stop praying. Don't stop coming to church. Don't stop being a blessing. You know what we need? We need greeters, people to encourage. How many of you love to come to church and someone saying, man, I can't believe you're here? No one would want to come to a church like that. Who would want to be a discourager? Man, they're here again? Why do they keep coming back? Who would want to come to a church like that? You say, I, I can't do a whole lot. I, I can't serve God, but you can be an encourager. Man, it's so good to see you. And don't be fake. Hey, it's so good to see you. I'm praying for you. And don't lie to them. <laughs> do it. Don't say you're going to pray for someone and not pray for them. And, and maybe someone will say, can I talk to you for a minute? Sure. Hey, not only can you be an encourager, but you can be a listener. Man, I'm just, it's been a tough week. Oh, what's been going on? And maybe they tell you whatever happened. They got a phone call or whatever. Man, can I pray with you real quick? We need that. We need encouragers. We need listeners. You say, I can't do a lot. Oh, you can do a lot with God. And don't limit God's ability. He served God up until God took him in a chariot of fire. And Elisha says, I'm going to keep going on. I'm going to continue serving God. He left behind more than just memories. Should the Lord tarry his coming, there's going to be a time where you may be in a casket. I may be in a casket. You're like, this is getting morbid. It's the truth, though. What are you leaving behind? Elijah left behind a mantle for Elijah. And that is to signify uh, not just the power and the calling of God, but what God will do with a man or even a woman who is just completely surrendered to the calling of God. 
I may not leave a mantle for anyone, but it would be my prayer, should the Lord tarry his coming, that my children will continue to serve God, that both of my daughters would look for a godly man. Whether he's a preacher or not, it doesn't matter to me as long as it's God's will for their life. That they'll continue going to church and that should they be at my funeral, they would say, my dad was a godly man. He loved the Lord. He took us to church every time the doors are open. But not just my children, but others who may be in that audience. He loved the Lord. May that be said of you. May that be said of all of us. That Man, he loved God. He was faithful. She was faithful till the end. But I think we're all just praying that the Lord will come back. And that would be fine with me too because there's no greater words than for the Father in heaven to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's worth it to serve God. You won't regret it. No one ever went to heaven and said, Lord, I did too much. (laughs) They all said, Lord, I wish I would have done more. Let's do more. Let's see what God will do with a church who says, Lord, I'm just going to obey. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we think, we're so thankful for this lesson, Lord, in the life of Elijah. Lord, what a life he led. Lord, what a man of God he was. And Lord, how you used him in such a mighty way. Lord, may we continue to be faithful. May we continue to be servants for you. May we get our eyes off of self and our eyes upon you. Turn our eyes upon Jesus, Lord. You're so beautiful to look at, Lord, and you're so worthy to be a ruler in our lives. Be with us the next hour. Be with our preacher, Lord. Be with the song service, the invitation, the special music, the choir. Lord, be with everything, Lord, that you may be honored and glorified through it all. We love and thank you in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right, I gave you 14 minutes. If you need to use the restroom or get a drink, you can do that in the kitchen. There's coffee as well. Otherwise, we'll see you in about 14 minutes.